Hello, legends and super legends. Welcome to Velo Harmony's subscriber hangout. Hope you guys had a great weekend. Um, we've started a big week here. We've done a lot of kilometers already. So um, today's session, uh, hey, Cardigan, how you doing? Today's session, we're going to uh, follow the same format. Uh, those of you who have not found out yet, we're currently on iTunes. Um, got it all sorted. I loaded the entire channel and also all the live streams are on uh, iTunes podcasts. I will be loading. Uh, hey, Paul, glad you could join us. I will also be loading the rest of the playlist, just like we have it on the channel. So you won't have to go through the entire channel. But the entire channel's there. Live streams are there. I will be loading the tips and group rides and other stuff, just as we have it laid out on YouTube, it would be a replication of exactly what we have on YouTube on podcasts. So if you don't want to watch, you can listen. Hey, Craig. So that's, um, and Robert, Robert said, um, my neighbor here, Robert Tangler said, the brand continues, something like that, I'm paraphrasing. So, so uh, people have asked for it and I went ahead and figured out a way to get it out there without having to pay someone to host anything. So it's basically a, an RSS feed from YouTube. So anything I do on YouTube will be fed there. I don't have to keep going back to update anything unless I set up new playlists that I haven't laid out out there. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Um, we got a suggestion from Christopher Roxbury. I put it on the list to do a video about indoor uh, rollers versus the standard indoor trainers or turbo trainers that they're referred to pros and cons so i will put something together ron tyner hey ron he said love the show well glad you join us man we're trying to keep this uh unique you know um it's kind of cool we stumbled upon it once youtube rolled out the feature where i didn't have to go get third-party software to do these it, um, it just seemed to make sense. Um, now I can relax and bring what I call special edition videos to you guys on specific topics. But this way we get a connection here where people can feel like they have access to me. And I think that makes a big difference. So I think that uh, this is the way to go. The metrics show that it's very popular. Munez Goro, he said, hello, H-E-L-L-O-W. <laughs> well, hello, Munez. <clears throat> so I uh, just want to let you guys know that we've got two additional super legends, two new super legends, Action Jackson's one of them, and uh, Randy Keir, who rides with us on Saturday. And, you know, that's always good that we get this kind of support so we can continue to do this. Those of you who are here, when it gets really busy here, I may not be able to get to all your chats. So you may want to look into, you know, in a way of supporting the channel, taking advantage of the super chat if it gets real crazy. Hey, Robert. Robert Tangler just showed up here. Valiant Floyd. Cool name. So Cartagen says, I want to get a tire bike, but can only afford the curve cycling frames, which have preset sizes as the custom frames in Australia are very expensive. Would you recommend this or just say for truly custom? I don't think you have to, to, to get truly custom. Um, what you need to know is your size before you buy it. So I would recommend you get a bike sizing done. If you don't have anybody that does it there, a fitter that does it, we offer that on the website. And there's a remote thing. There's a form that you fill out. And I can tell you what sizes are going to be easy for you to fit. So you don't have to get a custom bike. You can fit, I can fit any bike. All I need to know is that the seat angle is not more than 72. You guys see my Colnago. It's 72.75, and I had to buy a 3.2 centimeter setback seat post made by FSA, and I used up a, a, like 80% of the rails on my SMP. So that's the risk if you don't know the angles of your bike. So that's all of that. We kind of take care of that for you. So if you know what bikes fit you, yeah, you can buy off the shelf. It doesn't have to be custom. 
because even the custom bikes they get you within parameters and the benefit is that we we consider your riding style you know that's up to our like kish so yeah you can get you can get curve but you know um yeah i know curve makes really good bikes so if that's the brand you're 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 sold on yeah definitely just before anybody before you buy a bike you no know, it's like going to buy shoes they, they the people at the shop if you walk in they may not be that great at sizing you so why take the chance you know spend a few hundred dollars you're gonna spend thousands of dollars on a bike and know what fits you know what ranges you look for know what angles and you can ask the questions even over the phone before you go to the shop you'll know exactly what you're looking for that's the way i shop i spend most of my time online i don't like to go to stores and if i do I'm going to call them, make sure they have what I want. I just go pick it up because shopping for me is a utility. It's not a social thing. So I hope that helps you. James Thompson's said, hello, I love watching. Welcome, James. We're doing this to, to continue the uniqueness of this channel because as Robert confirmed, no other cycling channel is doing this. It does require, and I know why they're not doing it. You have to know your stuff and you have to be willing to look up what you don't know, as opposed to just blowing smoke when somebody asked the question. So if I don't know something, I will write it down, research it, and get back to the person. But you have to have the experience to be able to explain, plus explaining it in detail, instead of just giving curt answers. And it ends up being like I'm making a video. That's why these are popular. Even after the sessions, people were, were getting 600, 700 views, and it'll probably keep growing as the channel grows. So yeah. Um, John Logan, hello, legends and super legends. All right. Well, welcome to Velo Harmony. There you go. <laughs> Do I eat vegan food? Munez Goro. Vegan food. I don't know what that means, but I think he means. I'm not vegan, but if you mean do I eat vegetables? Yes. About 90% of the foods I eat come from the ground. I don't eat a lot of animal stuff. You know, I'll eat fish, chicken. I eat eggs. I love egg whites. I make my own omelets every morning pretty much when I have to. It doesn't take long to do. But yeah, I, I just eat. I'm not, I've tried the strict vegetarian stuff. It didn't work for me. But I eat everything. Beans, broccoli, you know, greens are, are good for you. You know, just all the foods. The key is just have a good balance. I don't restrict myself. If I have a taste for something or if my body craves something, I, I get it. I eat it. You know, that's it. I just eat. I eat and I ride. I sleep. <laughs> you know, eat, ride, sleep, or ride, eat, sleep, whatever you pattern. I ride whenever possible. You we ride all the time. Riding for me is like it's part of my life. So, you know, I start my day with a ride. It doesn't mean I'm killing myself. I just go ride. Just ride the bike, kind of get yourself going and take that energy into the day. So let's see here. Uh, Hello from Beverly Hills, California. Michael Farzan. Beverly Hills. All right. There was um, a show called Sanford and Son. I used to watch. They still show it on YouTube. And so Red Fox and Damon Wilson played that. And there's a scene where he says, he says to, to his son, if you go through Beverly Hills, you're going to leave feeling like a cheap watch. If you, if you drive that truck, they had this, you know, they ran a junkyard. And then Damon Wilson character said, what do you mean? He said, you'll be stopped every few seconds. <laughs> so, so Beverly Hills, California. Hey, from Virginia, Joe Dietrich. Hey, Joe. Eric N Nell. So Peter, hey, all from Crystal Lake, Illinois. It's got to be cold up there. We, the front we had is moving your way. The rain that we had. It rained today, and now it's beautiful. The, it rained while we were riding, and then at the end of the ride, the sun came out, the skies were sunny, just beautiful. I was like, man, and it warmed up, you know. It was like maybe 8 or 9C during the ride, and right at the end, it got above 10C. It just felt balmier, you know. So we, our weather just changes, so you can't, you can't let the weather mess up your plans. I just adapt. You got to get out there. Let's see here. Um, John Logan, he said, have you done any long distance events? Thinking about doing a 320 mile in 24 hour challenge, one end of Scotland to the other, wondering about an eating regime. 
Yeah. Um, variety. I've done. I haven't. I haven't done stuff like you're trying to do. I have not spent more than eight hours on the bicycle. The longest event I've done was up to eight hours. Now, so if you're going longer than that, of course you got to prepare. You don't have to do super long training rides on every ride. But you need to put that put enough long rides in there and then have frequency. You need to ride often to get ready for that. But as far as eating, you need variety. Don't just eat one kind of food, meaning if you're going to do gel, also take some solid foods. What a uh, sandwiches you prepare at home, whatever you like that you know you can keep down. Do not try anything new during the event. Anything you do in the event, you must have done in training because you don't want to upset your stomach. So you want to eat variety. And the key is that eat before you're hungry and drink before you feel thirsty and you will be good. Don't fall behind. Uh, Sebastian Martinez. He <laughs> said, what's up, super legend? Welcome. Robert Tangler says, I've been trying to sign up for a bite sizing, but I keep getting a 502 error on the website. That's odd. Let's see. Bike size and service. I'm actually on the website right now. Let me see what's going on. It's working for me, Robert. It loads the page. Let me see if I can add to cart. Uh, what are you using? 502 means that your provider is having trouble resolving something. Might be a DNS error I'm speculating. Let me see here. It's working fine, Robert. I just did add to cart on the same thing. And it's in there. Um, if you're using another network other than what you normally use, you may want to connect using some other means or maybe clear the cache on your browser. You know, there's something going on with your connection. It's only happening to you on the, the, the wireless or whatever service you're using to connect to the Internet. If you're using a, a tablet, maybe try it on your phone or, or try it on a desktop. You shouldn't be getting a... Any error on the side, the site's functioning fine. So, so just just see if you can just clear that browser or shut it down, clear the cache and try it. You shouldn't be having that problem. Rico says, hello from Imperial Valley, California. Hello, Rico. Rico Rivas. <laughs> Peter Rogala said it got snow. Yeah, it's cold. <laughs> it's cold up there, man. Put that bike on the trainer, open the window, and smile at the snow. Noel Pagan. Hey, Noel. Noel's one of the guys that took advantage of our remote fit, and he bought a bike that was very short for him. He's a big guy with long arms, and he bought a frame. You know how these guys are. They make the frame really short. So Noel ended up having to get a 15-centimeter stem. And so, But that's the key with the service. I could tell him exactly what to get. And right now on the market, the longest stem I've been able to find was a 15 centimeter by triple T. I wanted him to get a minus 17 drop, but he got a, a, a plus or minus six. And so we moved some spacers to get him the same drop. And he was very happy with it. So we got the bike to work for Noel. So Noel says, how often do you replace bearings on your wheel sets from riding in the rain or training? Actually, no, the rain does not bother the bearings. Your bearings not going to wear more because you're riding the rain. Because I'm not riding in floods to where it's immersed in water. The rain on your wheel is not going to affect your bearing life, per se. I don't mess with my wheel bearings that frequently because the wheels I use now, they're made at the factory, and they have a lot of seal bearing. They don't have, like back in the day where you had the little balls in there. Those need like annual service where you get them out to make sure they're not pitted and then you, you put grease and put them back in. The ones that the wheels I have have what they call cartridge or sealed bearings. So really, even if you wanted to get to them, they're just a pain to get to anyway, but there's not much you need to do to them now. And that's what's happened with the technology of, of, bike, of wheels now to where the, just like our bottom bracket has cartridge bearings now versus back in the day with stuff that you needed to maintain. So really, for riding in the rain, it's not going to bother your wheels that much. Um, it's funny you brought that up. Um, I guess I'll do a video later about it. We found a way to seal the cleat holes. We found that the water making your feet wet, if you have good overshoes for the rain, 
you still get water under where the screw holds your cleat to the shoe. They come in under there and your feet get soggy. So I'm going to try using silicone. We use plastic and it worked, but you still got some dampness in the shoe. So you got to take it off and dry it out because you don't want mold or anything growing. So I got the idea today to put silicone inside the shoe, but that requires that you open the little panel that every shoe has for replacing your threads if you strip them. My shoes happen to be open because I've replaced the threads before. And so I will do a video about that. I mean, and it's kind of an extreme. It might not be for everybody. But I, I rode today and my feet were happy even though it was wet. So there's a way. But uh, no, don't worry about any extra maintenance because you're riding in the rain unless you go through floods. And then your, your bike gets immersed in water. So yes, then you definitely your bottom bracket would need to be serviced and all that kind of stuff. But uh, mm -hmm. nowadays, these wheels are like bomb proof. You can use them for years. You know, I just spin them and I listen to them and if they're smooth and quiet, I don't mess with them. All right, let's see. Um, what is better? This is uh, Baka. I'm going to try to pronounce. He's got a Z and a T. I think it's Zerko, Zerkovic. Or because if, if I'm using the Z correctly, I hope I am. But I remember Baka. He said, what is better? Classic Nordic skiing or skating? I mean for cyclists. <laughs> yes, we got store snow. Um, it's hard to say what's better. They're both good uh, because uh, I, for one, know that Greg LeMond used to do the Nordic skiing, what they call, I guess it's like cross-country skiing. He used that. That was his sport before he got into cycling. And I also know that Dr. Eric Hayden was a, uh, an Olympic speed skater for the U.S. And he, he and after and he used to ride the bike in the summer to stay in shape and ended up joining the 7-Eleven team. And he was very, very good in cycling. So both are good. I don't know which one is better. It depends on whether you want to be focused on sprinting. Then I would probably recommend skating. But for endurance, the Nordic would be better for long distance stuff. And then skating would help you sharpen your speed, similar to rollerblading nowadays that people use. So it depends on what, what you're interested in. Eric Knell says, Eldred, are you or any legends or super legends on this hangout ever, ever tried the liquid IV hydration supplement? No, I haven't. I'm not, sh I'm, I'm not familiar with it at all. I don't do a whole lot of supplements. I just I just eat, you know. I don't do a whole lot of special stuff. I carry food on the bike. I use the SIS nutrition because because it tastes like juice. It's not thick and gooey. And I really carry granola bars and I make banana bread here at home. Some some guys back in the day would carry peanut butter sandwiches, would cut them up in small bite-sized pieces. Because you don't really need all the specialized stuff. I only use the gels when I'm going hard because I want the energy within seven to ten minutes. But, uh, you know, I don't use any supplements. I, what I do is I make sure I get enough rest. That's the key is you, you have to recover so you can train again. Because the more training you get and your body recovers, you get stronger and faster, you know. And so, um, yeah, I, I don't really do anything that special. Just eat and get enough rest. Now, rest doesn't mean sleep necessarily. You have to relax. You can't be, if you have a heavy load at work, don't train heavily during that those times when you're under a lot of pressure at work because all of that adds up to wear your body down. So you want to pick the times at work when work is steady, and then you can ramp up your training. When work is very stressful, you back off, especially in the winter. A lot of people spend more time with work, and then they just do less volume of training. Because all of it adds up. It's not just training that wears you out. It's life in general. Yeah, John says, I will, will need, he said, thanks, Elder. We'll need to work out some training plan event in May next year. Yeah. Yeah, John, um, I mean, if you need my help, we, we offer services. We can do something custom for you to put something together. But the key is that you get there prepared. I worked with a guy in Norway, and it was Abel Bajay. In fact, he sent me an email. He wants me to work with him again for the 2019 Tapete Tour. I haven't had a time to set up a session with him. We usually do Skype to kind of just chat and have a consultation. He, he has specific things he wants to improve on. You do need to go there prepared knowing you can handle the event. 
but it's kind of hard to ride 24 hours when you're training. So what you want to do is just do long enough rides and consistent rides. They don't all have to be long to where you know, oh, I can go eight hours or seven hours. And then you would just do more during the event. Like the challenge will be not falling asleep because a lot of the guys that would do the race across America, they would stop and sleep maybe an hour or so and then they get back on the bike. But they have support. I'm sure you will have some kind of support if you're doing a 24 hour thing. It's hard to go 24 hours without getting some kind of rest. All right, let's see here. Um, Milo or Milo, M I L O Bueno. I'm bringing your videos. They are awesome. I'm bringing your videos. Okay, well, good. Milo. He's from Colombia. That's, a, that's, that's where uh, Naro Quintana is from. A lot of champions are from Colombia. You guys have had a lot of champions in the Tour de France. That's the land of the climb, the, 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 the land of climbers. A lot of angels have come from there. Sebastian Martinez, Remote Fit, recommended you really learn about how you ride. Oh, Sebastian uh, is just one of the guys I just recently helped to do the Remote Fit. And he was busy. He was traveling. You know, we, we give people enough time and to kind of get to it. Because I like for people to get into it and ride their bike. And Sebastian travels during the week. So he didn't have as much time. But sometimes he'd go out at night. He lives in the Miami area. And he'd ride and he'd send really good videos. And that's the thing. I can look at you. The challenge with Sebastian was that he's a big guy like me. He's a little heavier than me now. I used to be 235, I think. But what happened is Sebastian has one of these fancy, beautiful, lightweight saddles. And so off the bike, he put the level on it. It would say level. <laughs> but then when he'd sit on it, it wasn't level. So he was still sliding. He couldn't do the balance test very well. So I told him, well, why don't we tip it up? You know, you got to be, you got to think outside the box. I said, why don't we tip the saddle up? And then when you sit on it, just go by field so we can keep tipping it up. Because we had to get him balanced before we could work on his cockpit. Because he was getting numb when he'd go hard in a group ride. And so we, we ended up playing with the saddles, one just very lightweight. But he also has an SMP in, in the house. And so I told him, I said, yeah. This probably came with a bike. You know, I said, that that's a very lightweight saddle. And so it gives on the big guys. Because I used to ride the Flight. They used to have a saddle called Flight. And it, it it had a carbon shell underneath. And it would just flex. You could feel it moving. So those lightweight saddles move. They throw you off when you're not on them. The S&P is so solid that if you put a level on it, it's, it's, it's going to stay level. So if you're not supposed to have it level, it will be uncomfortable. Because some riders like the S&P down a little bit. Up to like two, three degrees, you can do that for some people. I like my level. It just seems to work. But uh, yeah, so Sebastian's experience, the remote fit. And it, it's very thorough. It's really for people who can do minor adjustments. Because I explain everything up front. And then I give people actual items. And then we do the video. And if we need to do something live, then we do. But Sebastian and I did not really need live stuff. We just did stuff over the phone. And he just sent videos. And that's true for most people. By the time you've, you've seen the premium videos on Fit that you have access to when you sign up, it's pretty clear what you need to do. Okay, so here, Chris Christopher Roxbury said, you rode a long time with a broken saddle. I think it was over three hours. SMP will be my next saddle. You know, I'm glad you mentioned that, Chris. Chris sent a video. Chris and another guy on the site. I don't remember his name. Well, Chris sent the video. The other guy just commented. There's a timestamp in the video at 22.29 where he actually, Chris, blew up the picture. The saddle's broken. I told Paul about it. What that means is that saddle had to be broken, had to have broken early in the ride. Because even at $22.99, we, we rode for like almost six hours. That's over five hours on a broken saddle. I have never been able to do that. I raced. I broke a lot of saddles. Breaking a saddle, the ride's over. Or you're standing. And I wasn't going to stand for five hours. So, yeah. If that's not good enough to let you guys know SMP is solid, it's not the lightest saddle out there. I think they're 200 and something grams, which is about probably close to a half pound, I guess. They're not the lightest saddles, but I tell you what, I'm not buying anything else. I ordered the exact same saddle. It's coming tomorrow. 
And then I ordered a different seat pulls, a carbon seat pulls. I want more flex on that steel frame that will, I will make with it. But that's it, that's going to come in a couple of weeks. I ordered the exact same saddle. The only difference, the picture has SMP on the saddle instead of cell SMP. For some reason, the new one, they, they dropped the cell and then they just say SMP and they made it larger and it says dynamic. But it's basically the exact same black leather saddle. Somebody came to the channel. I ended up removing the comment. Some guy came to the channel and said, you can weld titanium. And now I laughed because, first of all, he said he's a welder and you can weld titanium. So the first question in my mind was, from a logical standpoint, what would it cost me to weld the, 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 the rail? Secondly, it's not titanium. It's stainless steel or steel, whatever, hollow steel. Chromoly, I'm sure it's chromoly. So he didn't do his homework, but he's giving suggestions. This is what I talk about. Be careful where you get advice from. And why would I do that? Why would I risk welding a weak part? It, it, so even if it cost me $100 to weld it, that's still not worth the risk. I'd much rather just get a new one, put it on there. And if it's going to last another four years, I'm good. Because this one was about four years, I'm estimating, because I used it long before I got any of the bikes you guys see right now. So it had a long service, and it still served me. I didn't even feel it, even though people could see it moving. So yeah, I'm, I'm with SMP. I'm with all the solid stuff. I told you guys I like solid, strong stuff. So I was able to ride for almost five and a half hours on a broken saddle. You try it out, anything else, most of them have single rails. And when one breaks, that saddle is just, you know, right away. And the SMP has rails that come and curve at the back. That's why we can put our lights on that curve. So it's it's a solid system. It's really good. They, they, you know, I don't know if they did it that way because of maybe it could be for the durability, you know, but I went to the site to look at a warranty and then it said 15,000 miles or 24 months. That's what they cover. And, and you know, I exceeded all of that. So I just ordered a new one. All right. So he says, uh, let's see, Michael Farzam, have you suggested SP Dynamic Saddle? You have suggested SP Dynamic Saddle. How wide they come? My current specialized 165 suggested by the fitter. Mm, I don't know if I can easily find the dimensions. Let's see here. I know I have it on a document. Um, I have it on my fit document. Let me go to iCloud bike fit. What I do is when I when I get a saddle, what happened here? I lost my screen for a moment. There we go. I'm back. Okay. When I get a saddle and I put it on my bike, I put the dimension of the saddle, the brand and everything because it matters. And when I do people's fit, I do the same thing. So your question is here. The answer is I'm just going to copy and paste it for you so you can see it as I speak. These are the dimensions of the SMP Dynamic, 274 by 138. The 138 is the width of the saddle. So you measure your, you know, some people have these things where you sit on a pad to determine how wide your, I guess, your hip hips are. And that's what people use. So that the 130 is probably what you care about. The 274 is the length of the saddle. And I think you're more interested in the one. Let me, let me close this document here. So yeah. So that's in my, my fit record. So if I were, if this stopped making that saddle and I were to go try to buy another saddle, I would try to stay around 138 because that works for me. The SMP is designed for most people. What are you small, medium, large? They'll tell you that. So they, they cover enough of a range to where it's just wide enough for the people that need the wider saddle. It still works for people that need a little narrow. So they, that's why I picked it because I read there's an extensive write up by Steve Hogg on his website. And that's where I read up about it. And I, I chose the SP because I had no shop that had loaners. And he just said that for most people, the SP would work. And when I went to the site and read up, it was, you know, it was a shot in the dark. It was around 300 and some dollars at the time I got them years ago. They've, they've since gone down a bit. So to spend that kind of money on the saddle, I figured I had to do some research. So I felt like, 
okay, it's worth the risk since it worked for most and it worked for me. And so I have the same saddle on all bikes. So yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, Baka. Let's see. Welcome. Baka says thanks for the answer. <laughs> now this is uh what's his name? Um SW said, hey guys, hey SW. So I hope this works for you, Michael. Marco Fazam, I just put the dimensions. I think that's what you needed. Um, Minos Goro, how can I get fitter in winter? Well, you can get fitter by doing uh, indoor training. I mean, I don't know where you live. If, if you can't go outside, I assume you got a trainer, an indoor trainer that you can put your bike on. But you really need some kind of uh, plan or a base training. You need to ride your bike. If you want to get fit in winter, but you, you're not going to be going hard. You want to go like zone two for the most part. Most of your training should be zone two. That will get you where you need to be so that in the spring, when you start to ramp it up, you'll have a base. So you need to do base training. If you need help with a program, I've already built them. They're on the website. Go under the, um, I think it's on the cycling services. Let's see here. Cycling services is where we put them. And there is a the training plans. There are two base training plans. One is eight weeks. One is 12 weeks. For those of you in the colder areas where the roads still close longer, do the 12-week plans. And that will give you enough workout. They're not slow. They're very good. It's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a workout to get you ready for the in-season training. I've got on the list to build in-season plans because Wesley Stevens one of them that's waiting on him. Uh, he lives in Missouri, and the roads still close to like March or April, something like that. So I'm going to build in season. I'm going to build early season and in season plans and eventually have plans for the whole year on the website. That's that's in the queue. So yes, you need to ride your bike to get fit in the winter. That's what we do. I ride all year, but I don't ride hard all year. So it's periodization. That's why I want to recommend you to that plan. You have to know when to let people who are riding too fast go in the winter. That's our problem down here. The weather's so nice. People ride hard. Same thing in Florida. People will ride hard all year, and then by April, May, they're sick of riding hard. But that's when the season starts, you know. So you got to really back off. You got to be disciplined. All right, Milo or Milo? I think it's Milo. Milo Bueno. I have a Rafa question. How on point is the sizing with the charts they have? Mm, they're pretty good. Um, I use them. I, I I wear a large in the pro team. And one thing about Rafa, they'll tell you on some of the, especially pro team, they'll tell you this is cut race fit. So if you know that you don't like your clothes fitting you very tight, then you might want to size up. But I always, I always, I like my cycling clothes to fit me differently than this t-shirt you see. Okay. I like my cycling clothes to, to basically be the wear when I pull it, it snaps back. That's why it doesn't flap when I'm on the bike. So you want it to fit you well. So yes, if you follow their sizing, they're, they're good. Use the chest measurements for, for their, their shirts and you will be close. Now they've, they've modified that sizing to where it says like for the large, it says 41.6 or something like that. It used to be up to 42. I just stayed with it because I don't care if if I'm 42 and the large stops at 41.6. I will take the jersey because the jerseys are stretchy, the polyester jersey, even the wool jerseys. So, yes, the sizes are very good. And a good another thing is if you do get the wrong size, it doesn't cost you any money. Don't tear the label or anything. Try it on because the classics cut, it's different than the pro team and so forth and the core. So they send you a label. It doesn't cost you any money to send it back. They're very good at that. That's one of the things I've, I've pushed about Rafa. Let's see here. Um, Noel. <laughs> Noel says, thank you. I won't mess with them. I'm ready to throw the mud guards on and hit the road. Yeah. I, I Actually, we did the rain today, and I, I left the mud guard on the bike. I just took a rag and wiped my tires in the garage because I bring it in the house. I wipe the tires, get all the, the, the mud off the tires, clean the drivetrain, just put a rag on it, spun the drivetrain. I didn't even need to lube it. Just got all the crap off of it and clean the brakes. And that's another thing about what people are talking about, disc brakes. That's the, that's the downside of the regular rim brakes. The rims get dirty 
they go through water, they pick up the dust, the grit, and it transfers to your pads. So when you break initially, you don't get that much slowing. It's almost like it has to clean itself, and then it starts to grab. So over the ride in the rain, you get a lot of crap on your calipers and your brake pads. So you want to clean that off, and you want to clean the rim. So I take a rag, and I clean the rim. I have a rag that's kind of dirty. Meaning I've cleaned it, but it's got grease stains on it. So that's for the dirty parts of the bike. Then I got to clean a rag for the upper part. So I just wipe the tubes because I'm bringing it in the house. If I weren't, I'd leave it in the garage, just clean the drivetrain and go out. Tomorrow is going to be nice. We're going to go out, but it rained today. So I know we're going to come across puddles of water. So I just left the mud guards on the bike. I took the Colnago out. So yeah. Be ready to ride, man. Just ride. It's just fun. You know, unless it's lightning and thundering, go out. We had our vests on it. It's just cool. No no problems with the rain. It was really nice. Okay, let's see. Yeah, Sebastian, good good question. Sebastian wants to know. Let me see here. Um, let's go back here. Baka is thanking me for the answer. You're welcome, Baka. That's, I think he asked about the Nordic skiing and so forth. Yeah, do both of them. Cross-country skiing is tough. Builds your aerobic capacity. Makes you strong. Um, so George Excluza, unusual name, of Puerto Rico. Welcome, my brother. My question is for, for a friend. He weighs 150 pounds and he's 5'11". That's a thin guy. He would like to know how to gain some weight <laughs> because he rolls four times a week about 80 miles, diet not working. <laughs> Dude, you want to know how to gain some weight. They ought to make a video about that. I think I don't think that's a problem we have in North America usually. But yeah, he is in South South America. But he, yeah, Puerto Rico, yeah. Um, you're part of the United States. I don't know. Um, I've never had trouble gaining weight. That that's the thing. It's like I, I have to watch everything. Um, I don't know. Let me turn on this light. This thing's getting the lighting is changing outside. It's later in the, in the afternoon. Um, I don't want to tell you to eat more because obviously, you know, if he's not hungry, then that's where his body wants to be. You know, I mean, he needs to make sure he's eating. Since you're saying he's riding 80 miles at a time, that's that's let's say four hours or you know, five hours. Just make sure that he eats during the ride. And then he eats after he rides and he's just satisfied. If he's satisfied and he's eating a balanced meal, I don't know why you want to gain weight. Maybe that's where his body, that's just naturally where he needs to be, you know, because uh, I don't think he's underweight. At 155, 11, yeah, he's a thin guy, but that's not bad. I've seen worse. So, no, I don't think he needs to do anything different. If he's, if he's not starving himself or depriving himself, just tell him, just make sure you you eating all the time. If he's riding 80 miles, I think I'm sure he's eating because you you know you you can't do it without food. So yeah, I don't think I think that's where his body, that's the way God made him. I don't think you need to worry about it. I wouldn't want to be lighter. I don't know how I would do that because I eat all the time and my weight right now is 86 kgs because we've been riding so that like it's 193 pounds or something like that. If I stopped eating, I'd probably go to 195, close to 200. I mean, if I stopped riding. So no, I don't. I don't worry about my weight. I just, I just work out and I, I eat. I make sure I'm satisfied and it settles where it needs to be. When I didn't ride for a lot of years, it went to like two thirty five. I can carry the weight because I'm a tall guy, but I knew it was a bit much, and so I just started riding, continued to eat. My weight came down. Right now, it's staying at one ninety to one ninety five. That's where it needs to be. I don't fight it. So yeah, I think one fifty, he's fine. I don't know why he'd want to gain weight. Unless it's a health issue, I don't know. I, you know, if he's riding that much, it can't be unhealthy. So no, he just needs to eat whatever he craves. Let him eat and enjoy. It. That's the way he's supposed to be. Don't worry about it. Let's go to um, Sebastian Martinez says elder dynamic versus former. Um, in fact, I was trying on with with the situation that happened with the broken saddle. I I was searching online and found one on eBay, a former on eBay. I'm tempted to try the format. The format and the dynamic are exactly the same in shape. The difference is the dynamic has a thin amount of padding. The former has none. So it's a, it's a shell and leather. 
So I don't know. That that was my thing. I'm like, if I were to try it, I'd want it at a discount. The guy had it on auction for fifty two dollars. I offered him twenty seven fifty, and my offer expired, and no one bought it. That's the reason I offered him that. I'm like, I'm gonna try it. I don't, I want to pay the least possible amount. So. Everything being the same, I, I stick with the dynamic because the former, since it has no padding, you have to be able to tolerate that. And, you know, you got you got padding in your shorts. Some writers do like that. But what, what I read on Steve Hogg's write-up, he has an extensive write-up on these saddles. He said that because of the dynamic saddle, he doesn't sell a lot of the former. And that was enough for me to pick the dynamic. Shape being the same and everything, so it just it will be something that you're just gonna try. Now you're in Miami, that's a big city. Maybe there's a shop there that has these on loaner, so you can get because they make them with like multicolor. They're intentionally making loaners for you to try. So if you get a shop that has a loaner, it won't cost you anything. I can't find a dynamic locally here for some reason, and this is a big city. You know, Houston's like the fourth largest city in the U.S. So I don't know. They're just not carrying them. If you can get it to try, try it. If it feels because it will work. Some some riders can even ride. Uh, I know uh, what's their name. SMP makes a, a saddle that's just a carbon shell. Period. Beautiful looking. And I, I looked at it. I was like, I don't know if I want to sit on that for, for six hours or five hours like we ride. You know. So some people like it, and if that can work for them. Think about the former having a little leather covering on the shell. So yeah, you you still gonna have to try it. It's exactly the same saddle. Try that, you know. But don't don't go buy it to try. You know, get get a loaner if you can, or get it on eBay like I'm trying to do. So I, hopefully I'll get it. If I get it, I will try it because I have I have extra seat posts for my bikes, so I can mount a, a trial saddle on another seat post and not mess with my current setup and just pull that out. And put that in, and, and so it's easy for me to try saddles because I keep extra seat posts around. Uh, so I, I will look in it. I'm trying to get it. If he can, if he puts that back up, I probably just grab it at fifty two dollars. That's not that bad. But I wanted to see if I could get it cheaper since he had no bids and he had only one day left. But he wasn't that desperate, so he just pulled it. Let's see here. Uh... Oh yeah, Noel says looking forward to the cleat ceiling video. The thing with that video, Noel, uh, I don't know if I have my shoes here. Every shoe, cycling shoe, has a stamped under the under the, the, the sole. If you take out the sole, the insole, the body of the, the shoe, they have a stamped uh, print of where they mount the hardware. It's, it's stamped to where it's not completely cut through, but you've got the markings there. So you have to take like an X-Acto knife and cut that out. That's where you go when you strip your threads. To replace your threads in cycling shoes. So my shoe, the one that I'm trying to experiment on, already I had already cut that little cut out to lift it. It's like a door, and I had replaced the threads. Because Giro sells the replacement, you just take that out and you slip it in. It sits in a cavity. So where those threads sit, that's where the water comes in. So when you're riding, I don't care how good your shoe covers are, you got that opening under here. The water is splashing through the pedal. Because remember, my pedal's open. I guess people who ride look blade, they probably don't have that problem. Because the water gets in there, and before long, you start feeling dampness under your foot. That's where it comes from. Because I've done it to where I put my tights over the, the over shoes and everything, and we still get that in it. So that's the experiment. So yes, I will definitely be making a video about that. But I don't know how many people will want to cut that little opening because they're not replacing anything. But it's not a, a, a problem. You cut it to where... It's almost like this. You cut it to where you just cut the bottom and you can lift it like a door. And then you do what you need to do and you lay it back down, put the sole on it. It just slips right back in place. So it's a flap that's there, but they don't stamp it to where it's cut through. You know, but it's really cool that you can replace your threads and not have to throw away your shoe. But yeah, I will definitely be doing that. I, I'm looking for ways to keep my feet completely dry. And today when we rode, it was rainy, water on the road. Well, two hours into the ride, I was telling Paul, I said, man, my feet are still dry. This is great. Because Paul came up with the idea to put the plastic in that door, well, over the door. Because if you don't cut it, you can place So if you just took uh, plastic, Paul used like shipping tape. And he taped under, you know, you move the sole and tape 
over that where that door is, you know, if you were to cut it. You could try that too, but still the shoe gets damp. The water still comes in. You just don't feel it quickly on your feet because you got plastic there. So I went one step further, opened the door, put the plastic underneath. So it did come in, but it never got to me until later in the ride. When I when I took the shoe off, my socks were a little damp. But this is almost four hours, three and a half, four hours in the rain. So I decided, I got the idea. I said, hmm, okay, what if I just sealed where they're trying to come through with silicone? Then you would only need to reseal when you change your cleat because that's the only time you'd move the screw. So you can see the screw sitting in there and you would just pour silicone over it from the inside and that seals it. No water's coming in. You know, I thought, wow, okay, so I'll definitely be doing that. All right, let's see here. Um, so Nicholas, Nicholas, that's our super legend. Hey, Nicholas, welcome to channel. Nicholas Rizos, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, John Logan, on Rafa, I found classic and brevet sizing to match charts. This is John answering. He said, protein jersey was okay, but much tighter. But protein jacket had to size up. Yes, that's exactly what I found. I made videos about it. Those of you who are curious about the sizing on, on Pro Team and some of the other ones, just go to the website and query up or go to the go to the playlist on the website and look at the reviews. I've got Rafa sizing in those videos, and that's exactly what John is saying here. The Pro Team jackets you have to size up. They're cut small, and they will fit you right. You go up one size. The Pro Team is designed to fit you race fit. I like my clothes race fit. I, I don't have a lot of classic jerseys because of what the sizes are off for me. The classic seems a little looser. Even the merino wool jerseys I have, what I do, I get them because I like that they have that little cinch on the side. Because if I didn't use the cinch, the waist will be like, a, like this T-shirt. And then if I put stuff in my pockets, which I do, then it starts moving. I hate that. So be, the jerseys where they have the cinch on the side, I buy those. But most of the other classic stuff, I don't get. But most of the classic things on there, putting the cinch on it. I love the protein because I like it to fit me like second skin. I don't want it to move because I, I load up my pockets. So if I'm standing to climb or whatever, I don't want it sagging. So you got that right, John. That's exactly what I found with Rafa. There are other videos that I've made that talks about the confusion with Rafa. Rafa makes a lot of clothing that cannibalize on the sales of other clothing. So you kind of have to, you end up buying stuff and you're like, why did I get that? Because this one does that as well. And then you're like, okay, <laughs> you know, I'm not using this because this does that. It, you know, it, so you got to really be careful and make sure you have the purpose when you start picking your stuff. There's a lot of overlap with Rafa. Let's see here. Um, John Marino. It's getting more difficult to find rims that accept rim brakes. The industry is moving the disc brakes even on road bikes. I have bikes that use rim and disc brakes. Any thoughts? All my bikes use rim brakes. All my wheels accept rim brakes. Um, I don't have a problem with discs, but just like you said, I don't care for people telling me what to do. If I'm spending the money, I'm going to tell you what I want. That's my attitude. If if it were free, then yeah, you can tell me. I, I don't care for that. Um, I wouldn't buy a bike that, let's say, okay, if the bike was on sale and it had disc brakes and it's a deal and it fit me, yeah, I would get it. If they were to stop making rim brakes and all they made were disc brakes and the bikes were a deal, I wouldn't care. But what I will not do is take my current rim brakes and consider it an upgrade to go buy discs. Because I see a lot of riders that do that. You can still see the holes on the little hanger where their brakes used to be. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to take a bike and convert it to disc brakes. I'll buy a new bike that has disc brakes. So if that's where they're moving... That's their prerogative. When I bought my bikes, uh, two bikes I have are custom. The builders asked me, what braking do you want? So the builders will give you the choice if that's what you want. But from my experience in the rain, like I said earlier, this, this bridge would have been great today because the water does not get on 
the disc necessarily. The water gets on your rim. The rim picks up a lot of crap, transfers it to the pads. Paul was cleaning his brake when we got back. He was wiping the brake and it looked like there was thick grease on the back of the brakes. Hands were all dirty. So, yeah, the, the rim brakes don't work great in the, in the wet. You kind of have to rub, scrub off the water, kind of like your car. If you drove through water, first time you brake, you know, they tell you to dry off your brakes. Same thing. So, yeah, the discs are an advantage in that manner. But my thing is that they they push the stuff to where they act like you must go back and retrofit. No. If they're moving that way, fine. If you're in the market for a new bike, I'm just hoping that from what I've seen, the, the pros ride, their disc brakes looks, they look clean. Because I've seen some discs that I wouldn't want on my bike. They just look clunky. The ones I've seen, Sagan and some of those guys riding from time to time, the discs look very thin and, you know, it just looks like it belongs on the bike. You guys know what I'm talking about. When when they came out early to put them on road bikes, you got all the wires hanging off your fork. Then they got twist tie holding it. What is that? If you're going to come up with something, it needs to look neat. You know, find a way to feed it to where I don't have to think of twist tie and tie it like, like somebody made it in a garage. And maybe in those instances, people were converting a bike that was not designed for the disc system. So they just ran the, 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 the you know, the, the wire, the hydraulic hose, and then they tied it to the fork. That, 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 they just looked messy, you know, like, like, a, as GCN said, they look like a, 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 a barge, I guess. I guess I think a, they got barge and they got hack. I think barge is like you're just, you're trying, and hack is like it's decent or something like that. I hope I've got that right. But anyway, um, the newer bikes that I've seen, they look right. And I think, like everything, it comes down to the discs that you choose because I know that the quality is better. I've seen the discs those guys use in the European Peloton, a few of them that have them. Now all of them are riding around discs. And they just look better. They're unobtrusive. They're not in your face. They look better. So, yeah, you know, but it's not that big a deal. The bicycle, I've never had problems stopping my bicycle. I say that all the time. My problem is going fast, not stopping the bike. It's not that big a deal. So, yeah, once they get it to where, and I'm sure it's out there. So if you're going to get this, get the best one out there because they're probably pretty nice. Because the, the average discs that were out a few, maybe a year or so ago, I would see guys that look like they took their regular bike, converted to discs. They were noisy. You know, I don't know what was going on with it. So it could, could be that it wasn't adjusted right, you know, like everything. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's a problem. I wouldn't have a problem with it, but you know, that would be going forward. My bikes today, they stop fine. I don't have a problem. Even today you break early, it cleans the water off the rim and then it grabs. It's a little noisy because the rim's dirty. And so then after riding, you have to clean the rims because that's your braking surface right there. You know? So with discs, you probably wouldn't have to do that unless you went through standing water because it's up. It's not touching the road. So I think that's a plus. I mentioned that earlier. So, don't worry so much about it. Stopping is not a problem for the bicycle. Regardless of whatever brake system they come up with, focus more on making sure your bike fits you. Because you spend a lot of money on a bike and it doesn't fit you, that's money you've wasted. You know, we're riding today and I was telling Paul, I said, I'm riding the bike and the, the saddle felt like it was just cupping my body. My feet felt like all I could feel was the pedal as I pulled back where my the arch of my foot made it with my shoe. So really, I'm going to stray on your question here and just focus on tell, telling people that focus on your saddle and how it mates with your underside, meaning the brand of saddle you pick. Focus on that. Then focus on the bicycle's seat tube being uh, with the right setback for you. If you're a tall guy, don't go with a 74 or even a 73. Look for the builders that are building 72s and 71 like Savello. Because you're a tall guy, you got a long femur, you need to you need setback instead of so you wouldn't have to get these funky setback saddles that look odd and you can't even get your seat far back enough. And make sure you got a long top tube if you got long arms. They're not building enough sizes now, so you got to be real picky so you don't end up with a very big unwieldy bike just to make sure it fits you. So really, 
if you get the saddle right and the shoe system for you, I call it a system because if you got flat feet like me, then Shimano, Giro, Lake, those are the three I've tried. If you've got an arch, CD's great. So, you know, you got to find a shoe that fits your foot. Those are the contact points that can really ruin your ride if it's not right. And, you know, then you see people having numbness and all that because the weight, you can't put the weight where it should be. So that's really more important than whether your bike has discs or not, because really, how often do you lock up brakes? I can't remember the last time I had to do I've done a video on that, but I've never had to do that. It doesn't happen that often. Most of the time when I'm riding and stuff happens, I'm looking for a little hole to get through. <laughs> but those of you who saw the video when those guys came from California and the guy crashed in front of me, there was no time to break. It was a wet corner. I just went straight. I just, I steered. And, and, and a lot of times, especially in the pack, that's what you have because you're moving. You're moving at 22, somebody falls, you don't have time to stop because then the guy behind you will run into you. So you, you, you're steering. That's the key. So don't worry about braking. It's, it's not that big a deal for us. You know, let's see here. Um, but he's right about that. They're moving more, more of the bikes that are coming out. It just have discs on them. They're selling them. If they're, if they're pretty and good and you get a good price, that would be great. Don't worry about that. Let's see here. Um, Howard, Howard just stopped by. Howard said he can't stay. Howard Bassey. Hi, everyone. Can't stay, but we'll catch up with the replay. I'm seeking the right saddle. On the very light side, I like Burke, Lupina, padded. But what you say on SMP make me think twice. Yeah, Howard, SMP is not light. Now, I'll, everything has a caveat. They make a light carbon saddle, but it's all carbon. And... It's a love-hate when it comes to saddles that have no padding. So that one, if you're looking for lightness, the light carbon has carbon rails and it's just a carbon saddle. The shape is what gets me sold on SMP. It's the shape. And today's ride with Paul confirmed it. Not that I needed that. We were going through sections where we're in the woodlands and the road was bumpy. And I was on the I was on the pedals, meaning we're going hard, you know, well, fast, not very hard, going fast. And I could feel the saddle just, but, 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 I mean, because I, because my weight was mostly on my feet and it was just cool to just feel that just tap against me. And every time it would touch me, it was, I said to say, it was just cupping me. Like everything fit. That's what you're looking for. And, and you know, when we say, when people say it's personal, that's what they mean. There are just certain shapes of saddles that would not work for you. And once you know that you stay away from them, the challenge is finding the ones that do. If you can find a place near you that make that carries SMP, try them. You know, try it because it's expensive to just buy. You know, so try it. You know, and, and I think you will like it because they have so many different shapes of SMP saddles. They've they've done extensive research into this area. That's why their saddles look a little. You see more of a dip on the SMP. It's not just, I didn't know they were that durable. I didn't know I would ride five hours on a broken SMP. That was not why I got it. I got it because it felt good. You know, so uh, to, to, that was just a plus. That's why I made the video. I'm like, I'm a believer. I'm sold. That little dip allows you to roll your hips. When I'm in the drops in an SMP, I can stay there all day. When I used to ride some of the other flatter saddles, you kind of had to wiggle yourself a little more. If you know what I mean, they've got a cutout in that dip. There's a cutout, so it just relieves any pressure. I can stay in the drops five hours if I wanted to. And, and that's, you know, I, I'm not saying that easily because it's hard for a lot of riders. So, yes, give it a shot. Get the loaner. And if you want to try the carbon, if they have it, that would be great because the carbon is expensive. And, you know, maybe read up on it, you know, just, you know, go on Google and query up SMP carbon. I'm sure there are some videos people have made. I have never written one. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about trying to form out. I was trying to get this guy to <laughs> give it to me for 27 something, but it didn't work out on eBay. Uh, but yeah, uh, I like them. I, I just like that they have saddles to fit everybody. It doesn't matter what is dynamic or other things or whatever, but they got form out. They got glider. They got all kinds of names. And you, But then the thing is you're trying. So unless you got a shop, 
that, that's not a good expenditure to just take a chance like that. Uh, let's see. Somebody's asking about physique. I want to make sure I don't miss people. I'm trying my best here. Let's see here. Um, mm, let's go to. All right. Craig Belton says, what are your thoughts about physique saddles? I, I rode the physique Arione. Nice saddle. It, it was a little long in the nose, you know, but it, it wasn't a problem for me. You know, at that time I was, you know, when I used to race, there was a saddle called Flight. That's what I used. And so I probably could have used like, a, because it was very thin, very, I mean, just less is more kind of saddle. It just always worked for me. I liked that he had give in it. So it worked really well, but it, it broke. It was the, 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 the carpet. I mean, they had like a plastic bottom. I wouldn't call it carbon, but it would give when you were riding. You know, over time, it just broke. We do a lot of riding with them. And then I tried different brands. I rode the Specialized Roaming also. I like the Physique Arione better. Now, I picked the Arione because I'm very flexible. You know, you go to that site to tell you, oh, you're a snake or whatever animal. You know, that that's how I did it. And so I got in and it worked. So they were right. If you're flexible, that works. It's kind of flattish, but it's a comfortable saddle. It's a good racing saddle. Uh, but I just, I, once I got to the s and I don't try anything else. So if you're trying a physique, find the one that suits you, you meaning that they, they tell you if you're very flexible, if you can do this kind of stretch, you know, if you can reach and touch your feet or whatever, you get this one. Stay with that so you can pick because they've got different models based on the flexibility and the style of riding of the rider. And then you get that one and then try it. But like anything, if you're going to try a brand and you go to physique, what I would suggest is you find what model will work for you based on your flexibility and then look on eBay. See if someone tried it and didn't like it. That, that's what's going on on eBay. There are people trying things, don't like it. It's brand new. Put it up for auction. And then you get it. You try it. Get it at half price or less. And then you try it. So you're not spending top dollars. That's the way to do it if you're searching. You know, SMP is not the only brand out there. A lot of saddles. I can ride a lot of different saddles. My body, my 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 body type. I guess my my the shape of my hips or whatever, however, whatever determines that my flexibility. I can ride the old what they call Concord, almost similar to what Lance used when he used to race. It's just a classic shape. Rafa came up with with some. I, I could ride those. Those are the saddles that fit me. Just simple with a concave kind of, you know, shape in there. The concaws San Marco used to make them. That's, that they, they would work. I don't ride very light saddles because I don't like for the saddle to move. I like to be anchored. I don't move around on my saddle. I, I get get it set and I sit in one spot and I work. Some riders move when they ride. There are some riders that ride like that, and then they tend to go with flatter saddles so they can move around more. Doesn't mean you can't move on an S and P. You can slide on the tip, but my my fit is at the point where I don't need to move. Whether I'm spinning high cadences or pushing, same position, and I think that's really efficient, you know. But yeah, uh, give it a shot. There's nothing wrong with it. They make good saddles. Let's see here. Uh, Michael says thanks for the answer. You're welcome, Michael. I'm scrolling through the conversations that's going on with the boys hanging out. Uh, Robert Tangler says, saw this Eddie Merckx quote, don't buy upgrades, ride upgrades. Yeah, I've heard of that before. You, you're not going to get much if you're trying to, you know, like some people will buy stuff that will, um, well, they'll buy like a lighter this and it's made out of titanium because the weight is less and all of that. It's hard to really, this marginal, you can't really quantify that. The, the one Good upgrade for any bicycle are a good set of wheels. A lot of bicycles, especially the ones off the shelf, they don't put great wheels on there because the price would just be too high. So they put basic wheels that you can use for training. But if you're going to do one upgrade, start with some nice wheels when you get the frame you want. It makes a big difference. I'm thinking about making a video where I took my bike, the, the orange bike, and I weighed just the frame with all the components on it, no wheels. I'm going to weigh it, and then I'm going to weigh my wheels so you guys can see the difference. And it's not just weight. It's really the performance, you know, the aerodynamics and so forth and so on. So 
down the road, one of the first things, you know, God willing, I want to put on the orange bikes, a nice pair of carbon wheels. Not super deep, but just, you know, because they do work. Once you get above 22, 23 miles an hour, it's easier to maintain that speed when you're rolling with those wheels, you know, whereas the wheels we're using are just standard box wheels. Yeah, you work harder. I don't mind it so much. But in an event you care for, if you, if you have the dollars, yes. First upgrade for a bicycle. Don't worry about components. Nice wheels. Because, that, that you know, once your engine's there, you will be able to hold the speed easier, use less watts. You know, the assumption is you got your kit together now. You know, I'm flapping in the wind with nice wheels. That negates it. So don't do that. Okay. Um. Anders Mogensen, hello from Denmark. Well, welcome. And they, they do a lot of cycling in Denmark, not just for exercise. They ride everywhere. I was watching a movie. It's not a family movie per se, but I liked it. It's one of those where it happened to be on the cable uh, satellite, and I happened upon it. It's, I call it a sleeper because I was half watching it and just got drawn into it. Some of you may know it. The Hitman's Bodyguard, Samuel L. Jackson, and the guy who played Green Lantern. Ah, he was also in some uh, R.I.P.D. movie. Um, what's his name? What's his name? He played a, a, a superhero. Yeah, Green Lantern and something else. But uh, they just had that chemistry. There was a lady in there that played a, a French police detective that was in the the movie called Daredevil on Netflix. She played Elektra in that series. I don't remember the actress's name. But the movie is so riveting in how they're relating to each other. He, he's protecting a hitman, this other guy. And just the, the interaction is something that's worth checking out. Samuel Jackson wrote a song in there. Uh, talks about life. You know, and it, it, it's and there's a lot of um, adult language in it. So, but it's still it's interesting. It says I watched this so many times. It's a very very good movie. And the, the what brought it to mind was uh, quite a bit of the scenes occur in Denmark when somebody's trying to kill Samuel Jackson's character, and they're just crashing into bicycles, and people have bicycles parked on the side of the street. It's like the bicycles outnumber the cars. There are bicycles galore, you know, and they're going through the waterways in the boat. And there's bicycles everywhere on all the overpasses. And I was like, man, this is really cool. You know, so that, that's, we don't get that here. You don't see that many bicycles unless you're near a bike shop and they're outside trying to sell it. <laughs> so that was what brought that to mind. The land of the bike. The Danish know how to ride bikes. It's flat there, but it can climb. So, you know, they use the wind. All right, let's see here. Howard Bassey. Hi, everyone. Can't stay. I think I read that. That was the saddle, yeah. So, uh, George Exclus Exclusa. He says, Elder, I'm trying to donate to this chat, but it does not cover my area. Puerto Rico. I don't know why they do that. I don't know why you would not be listed on there doesn't cover your area. That's weird. Yeah, I don't really know why um, YouTube would block Puerto Rico. You, you're, you're part of the U.S. U.S. territory, supposedly. So I, I don't really know if it's only for the 52 contiguous states or not. I don't know how they do that. But that's fine, man. The thought is appreciated. Don't worry about it. You can go to my the, the website, veloharmony.com. There's a donate button there. You can use that. Don't worry about these guys. El Mascarado. That is that's a cool name. Mascarado. That's almost like an old western name, you know, like a cowboy name. Like, you know, Mascarado. Rafa sizing. I wear medium in protein stuff and small on core. Yeah, we found that. My buddy Paul bought the core and it was flapping. And and his size is a large. He bought the same size, the core was looser. Yeah, it's weird. Isn't that something? You have to downsize on the core. I think he ended up doing that. I think Paul ended up doing that. Yeah, the, the core, I, I stayed away from the core. My issue with the core was I bought uh, like a pink and a white. I even did a review on it. 
but it, there, there was so warm for where we live. I couldn't wear the thing that much. Rafa is not inexpensive. So when I buy this stuff, I want to wear holes in them. <laughs> so if I can't use them, I'm mad. <laughs> so, so I want stuff I can wear most of the year. You know, even if I got to put a base layer under it, I want stuff I can wear. The cool was very warm. You know, so it's it's great for people up north, I guess. You know, I just it was hanging around. I sent it back. I was like, I'm not gonna get much use out of this. I want to stretch George Washington the way he grins. <laughs> so, <laughs> but those of you who don't know, he's the guy on the dollar. Those of you who are not familiar with the American monetary thing, you can see here. Um, Howard Bassey. Most of my stuff are Rafa's. But I'm reading a lot of good things on Asos bibs. What is your take on this brand? I only have one. <laughs> They're expensive. <laughs> They're good. The reason I laugh is, yeah, I like their stuff too, but I didn't, I don't find that many sales. And, um, you know, yeah, I have one. I have the Uno from years ago, and I, I wear it from time to time. But, yeah, they, they make good stuff. I like their bibs. Uh, their jerseys are a little wild for me. Even though I like colors, yeah, they they just busy, you know. They have a lot of stuff going on, like the old cycling jerseys where they're selling everything, you know. That's why I like Rafa. It's more classic, you know. Less is more. They got a little name on here, so maybe on the band, and that's really why he started that. This is a Rafa T-shirt that I got a long time ago. Uh, but yeah, um, yeah, Asos makes good stuff. I have not owned their jerseys. I've owned their bibs. I, I own the white bibs. I sold it on eBay because it just, it kept getting dirty. I mean, it's like the white bibs is just not a good idea the way I operate. If I change a flat tire, I want to be able to wipe my hand on my bib without, you know, I like to look neat. I don't want the thing to look messy. So I was like, man, I wasn't wearing it that much because of that. So I put it on eBay. Somebody grabbed it. That's how good they are. You can wear the stuff and still sell it on eBay used and people are all over it. So yeah, you can't go wrong. I mean, it made good stuff. Somebody sent me a link for, the, for an Asos outlet here on the channel. And, and every time I go there, everything's sold out. So everybody, I guess the word's out. <laughs> you know, so by the time it gets to the outlet, it's gone. So I couldn't get anything. You know, so yeah, they need more sales. That's what they need. I don't know. I guess they go through. I know that, I know competitive cyclists, and I think Colorado cyclists may carry their stuff. Yeah, just need more sales. See, Rafa has sales where they'll go up to. 50% off and they send you emails. and So I guess they sell direct. And I don't know if ISOs is doing that. I know the factory you can go there. So that's the only thing. I just, I want, I want to stretch my cycling dollars. This stuff adds up. I mean, look at it this way. I just broke a saddle that I paid maybe $330 for four and a half years ago. I wasn't planning on replacing a saddle. So if I don't stretch my cycling dollars, then how do I get the new saddle? So that's the thing. I wasn't planning on it. So I had to tap into some money that I had allocated for other things to get a replacement saddle. So you've got the plan like that. You got to put a little something. If you're riding a lot, out of every paycheck, put a little something aside for your cycling budget, for whatever it is that might come up, you know, tubes or whatever. So when it, I buy tubes when they're on sale. I'm waiting. The year is ending. In January, everybody would have bought, you know, we got like all the neighbors, Paul and I was laughing, went through some neighborhood and this guy had, uh, uh, what what was it, Snoopy, Santa Claus. It looked like a, like a like an amusement park and it was just somebody's yard where he's got all these balloons, well, they, they fill them with, with air. It's supposed to be, you know, reindeer or whatever for Christmas. And, and, and this is foreign to me. Because where I grew up, there is no Santa Claus. He doesn't exist. We don't know that. And here is like Santa's everywhere, and you think this is Santa's birthday. And I was like, did they change the meaning of Christmas? <laughs> so, so I make sure I teach my kids what it's about because I, you're not going to see Santa Claus in my yard. <laughs> I don't think he'd fit through my chimney anyway. <laughs> Anyway, let's see here. Let's go to uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Howard. Yeah, that was Howard. He said, uh, thanks in advance. I think I answered his question. Do you have a favorite? This is Anders Mogensen. I think this is the Dane. Yeah. Yeah. He said, do you have a favorite race you like to watch and why? 
Ha! Ah, they don't really show it that much anywhere anymore. I don't know uh, if they still do it. Liege, Bastonia, Liege. Um, I liked it because it was very long and a lot of short, choppy hills for a punchy type of rider. And there were two riders that back in the day, early 90s, they're about Moreno Argentine and the late Claude Criquillion. They called him Crick the Lion from Belgium. Those guys used to battle. I mean, it was just these guys would attack, attack. I was like, where are they getting all that? So, yeah, back in the day when people, there were no power meters. These boys just rode. You know, get in the drops and just go. That road, that that race, Liege Bastonia Liege is long, hard. It was always raining. I think I only saw one edition where it was dry, but it's still cold. And it was just a hard race. Those, those that I like those races, the early classics. There was another guy named Edwig Van Huydonk, very tall, lanky rider. I think I was he a Danish rider? I don't know. Edwig Van Huydonk. Long legs, lanky. Looked like he might have been six five. You know, just big guy, and he would just ride away from people. Had just produced a lot of power. I used to love watching those early the, the classics. You know, Paru Bay is okay, but most of the time it's too muddy or too dusty. You know, it's a strong race for a strong rider. But I like the ones where you have all these climbs where you would see the group. The group would start out and just people would just fall off. It's like attrition. They would just get worn out throughout the ride. You end up with a small breakaway every time, you know. So yeah, that's that's my favorite. I hope they still hold it. I, I haven't seen the recent one, but Liege, Bastonia, Liege. That's that's a race. That's a race. Let's see here. Um, how do I get arrow without a sore? <laughs> this is Munez Goro. What do you mean without a sore? I don't know. You're going to have to clarify that. How do I get error without a sore? S-O-R-E. Without a sore butt, I guess. <laughs> Maybe that's what he was saying. Ah, uh, You want to get error. Munis, it starts with a fit. The bike needs to fit you. When your bike fits you, getting error, you don't think about it. You just get low. The reason why most riders can't get low, they're not comfortable where they're sitting. So it hurts. And I think that's what you're talking about. If you're uncomfortable, you're not going to want to stay in the drops because either the bars are not where they need to be or your saddle is not under you to where it just cradles you. The bike should feel good in every position. Just like when, when a, a good fitting pair of shoes are on you, that's how the bike should fit you. And uh, I stress fit, and that's why I put on the banner, it all begins with fit because a lot of riders that are not competitive or they did not race, they ignore that. And the reason why racers do it is when you get dropped in a race and you watch the other guys make it look so easy, you get to realize something's wrong because you can't generate power if your saddle's too high or it's out of position. You start moving. As soon as the race gets hard, you start scooting on your saddle so you can ride. Your body wants to put you where you should be when it's time to go hard. But if that saddle's not there, then you end up sitting on the nose or somewhere and it just chafes or hurts. That's what happens. So people that compete immediately realize something's wrong with my setup. Then they go and try to get a fit. Or if they have a coach, a coach spots it and says, okay, you, you need to get this thing dialed in. But the guys who just ride, like I showed on the video, that guy who was acting like the champion of Montgomery, for those of you who saw it, if you saw him come around on that hill where I was talking about why is he expending the energy? He looked like he was rolling on his bike. You shouldn't be rolling on your bike like that. He sits too high. The saddle's not where it needs to be. So he's expending energy. And it, the point is that he's not efficient. So when we go really hard, he gets dropped. Because he can't go hard very long. When, it, when you're uncomfortable, you don't want to be there. And every time you stop to move, you're not pedaling. Then the gap opens. So now you got to work twice as hard to get there. Then we we don't we're not slowing down. So then you don't want to sit there. So you keep moving, you're shifting <laughs> instead of pedaling. That's what happens. <laughs> so yeah, fit. Start with fit. The bike needs to fit you. It's like getting a pair of shoes to do a marathon. Doesn't fit you, you're not gonna perform. So yeah, start with that. Um, let's see here. Mike G. Hey Mike, he says. Uh, 
<laughs> he's got something. He says stopped. Oh, he went to Rafa. Mike, my, I think Mike lives in New York, and I think they have a Rafa uh, club. That's what they call their stores. We are not fortunate enough to have a Rafa club in Houston. I get everything online. I believe we have. Uh, there's a shop that Lance Armstrong has called uh, Mellow Johnny's. They carry some Rafa stuff there. It's in Austin. It's about two hours by car from here. Um, let's see. He said he stopped there. He copped some Czech socks, navy, and winter socks blue on the trainer now doing some training. Mike G out. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I hope they were on sale, Mike, because New York is expensive. <laughs> As Brito, thumbs up. Hey, Trini. Trini Cyclist just came in to join us. Eric Nell, Howard, I have uh, – I'm looking at the time here. Okay. Eric Nell, Howard, I have worn several brands of bibs, and in my opinion, Asos is the most comfortable. They're expensive but worth the money. The quality is great. Yeah, I mean, bibs, like everything else, it's it varies. I, I have Asos, and I have Rafa, and I'll take Rafa every day of the week. And so if Asos work for you, that's great because it's kind of like saddles. You know, you have one you prefer. Now, I also have Castelli, and I have a pair that's really comfortable. I had a pair I hated because, you know, Castelli, they, they, they get crazy. You know, they do something that's always different, so you got to be, you know, really careful. But uh, I, I wear Castelli. They're fine. But I, I just, I once I found Rafa, their stuff just fits really well. You know, now I haven't tried all the assholes bibs that are out there. But you have to have an open mind. It doesn't really matter. If you find one that works for you, that's great. But don't just say, oh, this is the only one I'm going to have. You got to, if the other one goes on sale, give it a shot. You never know. You know, I even, I try, I have a couple of La Passion bibs. They're okay. They felt a little rubbery compared to the, the way the Lycra feels for, for Rafa. And But they're fine. I wear them. They're navy. I didn't, I didn't have any navy bibs. So it was cool to get that especially in the summer, they're navy and they're light. So they're very breathable when it's humid down here. So, yeah, so I'll wear anything. You know, if I still send me some bibs on the channel, I'll wear it. doesn't matter, you know. As the channel grows, you know, we've been getting people contacted, mostly from China and other places, the, the smaller manufacturers wanting to send stuff. But once I get the link and I go and look at the stuff, I'm like, that's not something I'm going to wear. I'm not going to bring it to the channel. So, you know, we're getting there. That You know, we'll, we'll get to that. But, yeah. They make good stuff. Like I said, they're high. I just I, I like deals. I don't like to pay retail if I can avoid it. So let's see here. Um, F R Z M I N seventy eight. I think it's Z Min. If, if I ignore the F R, I don't know how you pronounce that, but I think it's Z Min. He says, "Hello, V H. If a bike is set on a trainer and doesn't see the light of day, does it need the same kind of lubing intervals as a road bike?" use outdoors mm, not necessarily because you're not exposed to all that dust and stuff that we get but i don't really know what you lube on the bike other than the drivetrain if that's what you're talking about on a regular basis uh if it's used indoors you, you probably will lube it the same way if you do a lot of riding indoors because the chain eventually the lube will dry out and you'll hear it get noisy depending on how many hours you put in because the hours that drive it but you might go longer than you would on the road because when you ride the bike on the road you get dust that adhere to the chain that's why we clean it when you get back home you're wiping your drive chain because it's exposed so yes you would go a little longer if you're only using it on the trainer but i don't think it would be too significant maybe maybe one and a half times longer just make sure you're not sweating on the frame and, and make sure you wipe the frame if you sweat on it. Uh, if you sweat a lot and make sure you're running a fan to keep you cool. When I work out indoors, I don't get any sweat dripping because I run. I have a fan on the floor that blows from the side. You don't want to blow straight at you. Blow from the side. It's just more effective at an angle. from that it hit your shoulder and your body. And then you won't have sweat dripping on there. And then keep a towel nearby. So if you do, you can wipe off. Some people used to buy those things where you put on the fork and it'll cover, I mean, on the handlebars. It will go over the stem. And I don't know, no necessary expense. If you're not sweating that profusely, I don't think it's a problem. Some people ride the bikes on the trainer, they sweat on the stem, don't wipe it off. 
Then on the ride, you'll see the bike, the stem bolts are rusted. <laughs> We've seen that. So yeah, don't let your bike get that way. You, you have to just drape a washcloth over it. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mike says he's wearing the check shots. <laughs> All right, let's go to Wildcat here. Hello, legend and super legends. I'm from France. Well, bonsoir for me. I don't know what time it is. I'm sure it's in the evening. Let's see here. It's 17, so it's probably like at night, six hours ahead, maybe 11 something. Bonsoir. Um, let's see. And I tried to watch your videos. I do like your channel. Well, thank you, Wildcat. Yeah, I'm teaching my, my girls a, a little bit of French. So my seven-year-old does not say goodnight to me anymore. She says, bonsoir. Then I tell her, bonsoir, um, mon chéri. <laughs> we had to learn a bit of French back home. I haven't used it in a long time, so I still try to keep it going. Because where we grew up, we, were, we learned the language of our neighbors to make them comfortable when they come there were merchants that would come to Liberia to sell goods and we'd speak to them in their language. Kenneth Daniels, what exercises can you do during the winter in the gym to get stronger and faster on the bike in the spring or summer? Okay. You guys notice that Ken is not, Kenneth is not asking about braking and he wants to get faster. That's the problem we all have. Well, welcome, Kenneth. Um... There is a video on the channel. Let me see here. The first thing I want to do is point you there. Whenever there's a video that covers this, you will get so much more than just me answering. So I'm going to find it. I'm going to put the video link here. And that way you can start with some of the exercises that are best for cyclists because you don't want to build muscle that you're not going to use in cycling. Um, I don't know what I called it. Here, workout. I think I call it workout for cyclists. It's amazing how the brain works. I made that thing more than a year ago, and somehow I remember the title. You don't want to just go out and do exercises indiscriminately so that you don't get bulky. Let's see, it brought a bunch of stuff. I guess I get a lot of workout videos there. Let's see, I'll call it gym. You want to do a lot of uh high repetitions um i'm trying to find a video but when you do get it i think i mentioned it in there um high repetition squats are good to build your your muscles in your legs but again do 15 plus reps as opposed to the power stuff where they do six or seven or whatever let's see here I think this video will be perfect for you. Let me find it. We got we got a bunch of stuff in here. Here we go. Okay, perfect. So I called it the best gym workout for cycling, which is right apropos for what you asked about. Here is the link, and this is there. You go. So that's the link for the gym workout for cycling and everything's in there for what you need. You know, squats, you can do, uh, I do a lot of core work. I don't go to the gym anymore. I just do use the, the total gym. It's more of a stretching. I do exercises that involve my body and gravity, kind of like they do in the military, chin-ups, push-ups, pull-ups. You strengthen all these little muscles. I do a lot of reps, low, low weight, a lot of rep to work the little muscles that we don't use when we're stationary on the bike. All of that helps you endure the long rides because when we ride hills a lot, if you're not strong, your back can ache, whatever, you know, but you have to keep your core, your stomach, work on your stomach muscles. Now you can work on your stomach muscles on the bike, meaning when you're riding, keep your stomach tight. That's a way of working on your core. So you don't, you don't have to go to the gym. But it helps. That's what he said in the winter to strengthen you and get you ready for the season. So I think that video will, will get you started. All right, let's see here. Hmm. 
okay, Munez Goro said, what type of road bike is good for a beginner? Because my friend bought carbon bike, he got into a crash. Um, carbon bikes are more prevalent and you know, they're easy to find everywhere. That's what they're pushing. Whatever bike fits your budget is good enough for a beginner. But the bike needs to fit your body. So you need to know what size is going to fit you. Don't just walk into any bike shop and trust what the person recommends because some bike shops, the, the, the overhead on a bike shop is small. They can't, they can't pay a whole lot. So a lot of times they have people working there part-time or whatever. So the expertise varies. And there are great bike shops everywhere that you may stumble upon that has you know, good people in there or, you know, experienced people that can recommend stuff. But but that's a crap shoot. So don't do that. Get a bike sizing done. Know what bike fits you. Know what you're looking for. And when you get there, you will be the authority and just say, I'm looking for this size frame. What are, what are all your 52s selling for? Regardless of what is aluminum, whatever. So it doesn't have to be carbon. It just has to do with what, what fits your budget. Your body does not care what material your bike is made out of. What your body is concerned about is, does that bike feel good under you in terms of does it fit you? Okay. Um, Cycle Jockey is here. Hey, Cycle Jockey. He says, can you comment on the importance of building base during the winter or off season and how that helps come race season? Yeah, that's a foundation. Without that, you're not going to be very, very fast or very fit. And that's what we're working on now. That's why I signed up for the Rafa Festive 500. Because all these people during the holiday, people come by the house to drop off food and cake. You know, they already started. We got two. We got so many cakes. I have to cut them up. I, you know, I hate for stuff to go to waste. The, the good thing is that the people in my life understand I, just, I don't just eat just any cake. So if you're going to bring cake, it needs to be a hearty cake, meaning either a carrot cake or something nutritious, not just you know the stuff that's like foam. You guys know what I'm talking about. Not a sugar cake. I don't want my girls eating that. So they brought cake that we like. All of us like it. The girls have been taking some to school. So I cut them up and I pack them in their lunch because my, my nine-year-old likes to take her own lunch. If I didn't do that, a cake would go bad because they brought so many cakes. So people just stop off, drop off cakes. So closer to Christmas now, there'll be more people dropping off. So we have a lot of food in the house. And that's why that's what got me into the Festive 500, I think, in 2016. The guy named um, Green Cyborg, a legend on here, recommended it. And since you don't have to go anywhere, I was like, I'm going to go ride every day. And my wife loves buying food and watching you eat. So it was easy telling her, hey, you want me to eat this stuff? I'm going to ride my bike every day so I can eat this stuff. It was great. It was a no-brainer. She's like, great, go ride. You know, <laughs> so, I mean, not that I had to do that, but that was just what I told us. So you guys have too much food around here. And after I ride, I come home and I eat. But I don't eat any more than I normally eat, you know. So that that's the thing. So, you know, it, it's all good. You got to live. So he says, uh, he's talking about, you know, so you got to ride. You got to ride consistently. Now, base training doesn't mean just riding easy. Base training is zone two mostly, but you still got to do some changes in there. You got to build your leg strength. You got to do some, you know, uh, what I call low gear, the, the, the big gear, low cadence workouts. That's what I put in my plan on the website that people get. You, because what it does, it prepares you for the work to come. And I also have people do leg speed exercises, their drills for set intervals so that you can build your ability to tolerate accelerations. All of that's in the base training, the different workouts in there. And that was what people asked for. So I, I set up an eight-week one and a 12-week base training. Check it out on the website. It's under the cycling services training plans. You'll see them in there. And what happens is when you have focused workouts, the indoor session is not boring because you go in there, you focus. Before you know it, you're done. And there's sweat everywhere. That's why I tell people to run a fan. If you don't run a fan, you can't do indoor stuff very well. It's, it's uncomfortable. You get hot. And then you drip. So I have the black mats under my bike for stability and to catch the sweat. So if you're on carpeted floor, get one of those black mats. You know, they sell them all over the place. 
I got one from Cyclops. I ended up with two of them. I actually have two in the studio that I use. So yeah, you need to train because if you don't do it now, then in the spring you're behind. You gotta you gotta be doing that when the weather's beautiful. What's the point of that? Do it now. We're training. That's what we're doing now. Base training. So a lot of times when I ride, and I did the last ride, I was in zone two. While that guy Rick was off the front, I'm in zone two catching him. That's why I look at these guys like I'm not even going hard, and they think they're doing something. So Paul and I laugh about it all the time because if I go really hard and I just end up riding alone or like I was sitting on that guy Will's wheel, we didn't have it on film. I'm sitting on this guy's wheel and we ride away from everybody. Except Mo, you know, Mo was back there grabbing people, bringing them. That's what he does. He does. And Mo ends up riding harder than everybody because he'll go back and bring people who have fallen off. And it's not easy when he's bringing you back because he'll put the wheel there, but he doesn't make it easy. You got to you got to work to stay on his wheel because he keeps edging it up because he wants to bring you back to the group. He's encouraging you to work harder. You know, so I ended up in a breakaway on Saturday. I'm like, I don't need to be riding this hard. And so I pulled out and I thought people were behind me. And when I pulled out, I was like, just the two of us. So this is not the time of year to be in a breakaway because then it's like, okay, what are you going to do in April? And, but down here, Florida, places like that, we have the great weather. A lot of riders would do that. When I used to race, they, they would do that. And then they come to the race early season, psychologically, they're burned out or even physically. They, so when we start to go hard, they just can't go. And you know, that guy's strong. You're like, what's going on? And they're just they're sick of it because they did it all winter, you know. And that's the thing. You have to hold yourself back, you know. So it's important that you stay zone three or less. And zone three is for your, your workouts where you're building strength, you know. So check out the plans. But, yes, you, you must do that. The, the serious riders do. There's just no way around it. Serious riders have a plan. Every ride has a focus. All right. Let's see here. Uh, Justin. Justin says, correct braking can get you into more trouble sometimes. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> um, and it's not just a bicycle. When I'm driving my car, I have gotten out of more scrapes accelerating out of there than braking. I see a hole and I punch through there because somebody has messed up. And I, yeah, sometimes you, you, you can, you know, not every time braking helps. So you got to make that decision. That's why when I'm driving, I only drive. I don't do anything else. This city here, we have a lot of inattentive drivers. I'm sure it's everywhere. People just don't want to pay attention. They need to take the bus. You know, <laughs> Then you can read and be on your phone, do whatever. They want to do it while they're behind the wheel. All right, let's see here. Uh, Murky Blaze. I don't think I've seen this name before. Welcome. What do you think of this saddle? Dash saddles.com strike stock. <laughs> I've never heard of that one. Dash cycles.com. Let's see here. I'm curious. Dash cycles.com. There is a forward slash. Strike stock. Interesting. Whoa. It, it, uh, the saddle he's talking about, I wish there was a way that would let me just share the screen. Uh, it says handmade in Colorado. It's almost shaped like an Adamo, but it's not split in the front. Um. I've never, I've never ridden an Adamo, but I see some people that have it. Two hundred twenty-nine dollars. Um, I'm not sure what problem they're trying to solve. It's got a short nose, like you would have on a time trial saddle, and maybe that's it. From what I'm reading here, um, there's a custom strike to incorporate the most common option, but in a slightly heavier form. They don't really say. It says handmade in Colorado. They don't say what they're trying to address. It says 245 millimeter length, UCI legal, 48 millimeter nose width, multi-density. It looks more like a time trial saddle than anything. It doesn't look like a road. Now, the Adamo saddle, a lot of people use on the road as well. Um, 
It says UCI legal. I'm not sure if that's because it's being designed for a time trial. It kind of looks like a little wide for me. Uh, you know, just look. I don't know. How, I don't know if I'd, I'd be comfortable on that. It's flat and it's got a split in the middle. DashSaddles.com. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't know. You'd have to try it. Like you know, it's very personal. I'm not sure why you're interested in that unless you're trying to fit that on a time trial bike because that looks like a time trial saddle. And the reason it's short in the nose is so you can place it five centimeters behind the bottom bracket or more because the time trial bikes have very aggressive angle because you're in a different position. That's what they're trying to address. And I think that's what that is. But yeah, you're just going to have to try it, but that's kind of expensive for a trial unless somebody has a loaner that you can use. But it doesn't look that crazy. I mean, Adamo looks like that, and a lot of the time trial saddles look like that. So John Marino still have to clean the rotors with disc brakes. Hydraulic brakes give better modulation. Rims will wear if you're using rim brakes. I've never worn a rim. I don't know why people say that rims will wear. Do you know how much what you'll have to do to wear your rims? You know what I mean? I, I, I just have never worn my rims or my brake pads. So I, I guess if you're riding down the mountain and you, you're you riding your brakes, which you're not supposed to, people talk about overheating the rims. You'd have to ride those brakes. What people don't do is they need to brake when you're going down a mountain. You brake, you scrub the speed, and then you take your corner. And when you do that, the rims will cool. You don't ride down the mountain on your brake. So I don't know what that is. After I ride, the rims get noisy. They get dirty. There's grit on there. So after the ride, you clean the bike. You wipe the rim. That's all you can do. I mean, because the braking is better when you clean the rim. But I don't see you wearing your rims. You know, I, mean, I, I see you wearing our carbon rims if you use the wrong pads, but not, not because of that. Disc brakes have their function, but that, that's not a reason to say, oh, I'm going to go to disc because you're going to wear the aluminum rims. It, it, that's a lot of braking to wear those rims. Let's see here. Um, Randy Hongo, I use SMP. Okay, Justin says, I've heard nothing but praise from SMP users. I just can't get used to that aesthetic. <laughs> He's worried about the look. I'm more worried about how comfortable that bad boy is. When I'm putting down the power, yeah, I don't care less what the saddle looks like. What is it supposed to look like? It's a saddle. You sit in it. When you sit on a horse, Take a saddle off a horse. It has the same dip. You sit in the saddle on the horse. Nobody cares. Nobody talks about the aesthetic of that because it works. You sit in the saddle on a horse. That's what SP figured out. You sit in that bad boy, you just you're locked in and you can put down the power. The, you know, you just there's a guy, the guy who was doing the crazy stuff in the video, his name is Scott. Uh, maybe a month or so ago, Paul was telling me about it because Paul, he was talking, he was talking to Paul. We we're on 1486 out of Dacus. Uh, what's his name? Victor had gone down the road and I got to the front and I just I started to go hard and I didn't let up. He turned around and, and looked at Paul and said, This guy doesn't let up because it was hard. And he's used to people going yo-yoing. No, it was on. When your bike fits you, you get a better workout. You can hit your zones. You can stay there longer because you're not thinking about anything. You're just riding. And I'm not saying SMP is the only one that's going to get you there, but find its saddle that does to where you're not thinking about the saddle. You should be riding to where it's as if to say there is no saddle there. And that sounds counterintuitive, but that's the experience we have. All I feel are the pedals when I'm going hard. Because the saddle's unloaded. And I was talking like today, the bike bounces and the saddle taps you underneath. That's it. Just a light touch because you're on the pedals. And then when you're when the power's off, you're more on the saddle. But either way, you're comfortable. It cups you. It just There's a perfect mating of that saddle. Whatever brand it may be, everybody's different. You know, but you can, riders can wear, can ride many different saddles, but you got to find the brand that works for you. And, and you you get that dialed in and you don't worry about it. So there's no saddle sores. I don't need to use any, uh, what do you call it, uh, chamois cream, all that stuff. You know, just 
ride. You don't have any discomfort because the saddle is in the right spot. And then you can really just perform. A lot of riders that are uncomfortable think every other cyclist is because that's all they know. You know, so. Um, but yeah, let's see here. Um, I hope I didn't miss anybody. Ron on your left. <laughs> Ron says good morning. I wonder where Ron is. He said good morning. Hello, Ron. Ron on your left retired. So Paul replied. Paul Ilonga said he had to downsize his core jersey because he had the same problem as the other guy who had to go down a size. Justin says, assos for the cold weather. Nothing beats it for here in Connecticut. So C. Kula says, have you ever been approached by an individual that you've commented on during the group rides? I ask because sometimes your comments are kind of stiff. Yeah, uh, I have, but no, not really. I guess Randy would be an example. My comments are realistic. I'm not playing games. I'm serious about this sport. And the thing is, is what happens is it's not, I don't, I'm not trying to make anybody look bad. That's why I always say this is a teaching moment. Because if 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 Scott watches that video, because I know they watch the video and we're here, we're right with them. I'm not saying anything in the narration I wouldn't say to his face. I want you to understand that. So I'm fine with that. Now, Randy. Randy was the one on another video that said, when you said, Randy, hold your line, because we were riding, and I told him, hold the line, I narrated about it. It was it was the hero's ride, and Randy actually used those comments, and on that video, you could see Randy had improved his line, because Randy was very unsafe. Randy's our newest super legend that we stopped on the last week video, so he benefited from that. If somebody takes exception to it and they don't like it, that's fine. Because my goal is to get them to be safe for all of us. So all of us can enjoy. So last week's video where this guy is doing whatever he was doing, we made no sense. Ca causing us to waste our time to wait for him. Then he comes to play hero at the front. He needs to hear that. Because believe it or not, the next day after that ride, he did the same thing. I went to the front. Paul and I were out riding. We happened upon them because we're on the same route. So we weren't really, we didn't go to the start of the ride. We met them out on the highway. And there was a guy named Paul H that had been sitting at the front. I could see him fatiguing. So I told Paul, Ilonga, we're at the back. Basically, when we ride with them, a lot of time when we're not filming, we don't draft. We sit about two or three bike lanes off the back, holding their pace. Because we want to work. We don't have to pull. And so we're there for miles and miles, and I noticed this Paul H was just pulling. And I told Paul, I said, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go give him give you know pull for a little bit, give him a spell. Because we're coming to where the hills were thick and fast. So I start to roll to the front. This same guy, who I call the champion of Montgomery, jumps on my wheel like we're racing. He had no idea what I was doing. All he saw was I was going to the front, jumped on my wheel. Then Randy told Paul, there's gonna be an attack. Because that's how they ride. It's like they act like it's a race, but they've never raced. So they don't really understand. So I'm going to the front to get the guy. So I, I slid in front of the guy, and then I noticed he was on my wheel. I was giving the guy my wheel, so there was no room for him. And we're on an open road. So what I did is I accelerated just enough so he could fit in there. And I kept the pace where we had a lot of weaker riders in the group. I kept the pace where... I was keeping my eye on those guys. Everybody was comfortable. It was hard, but not too hard. So after the group was together, and we're going, and this is Sunday. So we, we start to go. As soon as the road started to go up, boom, he goes, which breaks up the group. Now, you know, I can do that, but I was like, okay, that's what I'm talking about. There is no understanding of how a group dynamic should work. This is a group ride. It's not a race. So he takes off, and that's fine. So what I did was, he takes off. I knew the road would kick up. I was in a small chain ring spinning on gear. I just I spun up to him and just sat on his wheel. As soon as the road kicked in, it's as if to say someone pulled him back. He was he was so concerned about the steepness of the thing, he kept downshifting to where he was spinning like a hamster. And you know how you get that feeling where they just come back on you. So I ended up just going left and going around him. Those two moves dropped the group. 
Paul Ilonga was caught behind Paul H. He didn't realize there was a gap. By the time he realized, the two of us were up the road. And the, the somewhere I'm going with this, what I did, the two of us were up the road. So because he had slowed down with that spinning out crap and I went around him, what I did is I kept, I was in a 39, 17 thereabouts, which I call my gear. What I mean is I was in a gear I could handle. I kept changing the cadence every second. I'd go 194, 107. All I heard was, uh, uh. I was, I changed the cadence for a long time. He was struggling. And then I looked back. I knew the group wasn't there. He was struggling. I looked back, shifted up, stood up, stretched my legs a little bit just to kind of change my position. He comes around because he like they like to do that. I don't have a problem with it. He comes around like we're racing. He goes full gas, hard as he could go. I slipped behind him, still in a small gear, just wrapped up to him, just sat. As soon as he started to slow down again, I could feel his speed. I came around again. And then he said, he was breathing so hard. You could hear, he couldn't even hide it. And that's another thing they need to learn. You don't need to let people know you're dying. You can, you can have like a poker face. He was breathing so hard as I came by, he tried to tell me, oh, we're gonna be turning right over there. Now, I turned right with him and then I stood up like I was gonna stretch. He said, no, we need to stop. The group is back there. As if I didn't know. So I pulled into the corner and I went to take a nature break because the group was a little ways back. Now, what's funny is the group pulls up and the guys he was riding with, the guys who I was trying to keep together started to scold him. And he's the leader of the group. Because somebody asked last night in the chat, did you tell the leader, you know, when I was talking to the premier, when I was talking, I said, did you tell the leader about that? And I said, no, he got dropped. He's one of the leaders. They started to tell him, when I came back, I was standing there. They said, Eldred, that was a great pull. It seemed very calculated. A guy named Doug was saying that he, he, he just had surgery. He's trying to get back in shape. And Sunday's ride is usually subdued. So he said the, the pace was perfect and blah, blah, blah. Then they turned to him, and you had to do this. So I didn't have to say anything. They knew. So the, the thing is, is that not everybody knows everything about group riding, but you think they would learn by just watching. I'm not racing anybody when I'm out there. I get enough of a workout by myself. And so he doesn't understand that because you end up breaking up the group. And these guys, they get tired. And then they end up going back home. You guys see it on Saturday. By the time we get out to Taco Corner, the group splits up. Because it's so hard. They start out so hard. They discourage some people. That's what I believe anyway. Some people are discouraged. They're like, I don't know if I want to go further with these guys. You know, whereas you guys see Paul and I riding when we used to ride, we would just ride for hours and whatever. It's the same thing I bring there. So for me, I don't care if somebody takes exception because what I'm trying to do is to get them to come and talk and say, hey, I heard you say this. So I can at least educate them because what's happening is all of them know about this channel, guys. Only one of them has taken advantage of the channel. And you all know who it is, Randy. Okay? So you can take everybody, give them the book. The same thing we talk about, all of us can go to school we all can take the test. Not all of us make A's. They know about the channel. They don't take advantage. Randy has learned so much. He's so excited. You guys heard him on one of the things saying the byline and all of that. They all know about it, but he's taking advantage. He's educating himself. There are a lot of riders, even in your area. Forget about these guys. You will find, this is a teaching thing for everybody. You will find that they're strong. They've been riding for years. They don't understand what they're doing. So they come out and do crazy stuff like Rick. Riding in the dirt, riding off the front, all that kind of stuff. Much to do. And two weeks ago, he almost threw up with the same group. So he doesn't even understand what he's doing, doesn't have a plan. That's what I'm talking about. And so my issue on the last ride, and I think that's what this person is referring to, where it can be kind of stiff. My issue on the last ride is don't take a pull and get dropped. Sit in so you don't get dropped. Use your energy to sit in because taking a pull and getting dropped is not smart. The French says, tete et jambe, head and legs. Don't just ride. Use your head. Don't fall off the pace. Then somebody waits for you. Then you race them because they won't wait for you next time. That's what they don't get. Okay? So that, that's the stuff they do. He's not the only one that does that. All of them do that. 
Because a lot of them don't really understand what they're doing. They just ride. They just ride bikes, and that's okay. And so what happens is this video is meant. I couldn't just film that, show him doing that, and say nothing. Because then this wouldn't be an educational channel. I had to say something about what he did. We happened to get that on film. It happens all the time. I don't say anything to them during the ride when they do it. They learn by attrition because what happened during that ride, when the camera ran out of power, when Mo and them went up that hill, the next series of climbs, we had about maybe five, let's see, maybe seven kilometers of climbs, he got dropped. So, so somebody asked during the premiere, did you say something to the leader? Well, he's one of the leaders. I said, no, he, he got dropped. So he'll figure it out. Oh, yeah. I talk with my legs when we're riding. You do something crazy, you will pay the price. I will wait for you. You will see us at the next ride. That's how I do it. I narrate for these because this is education. That's why I carry that camera. That's why you see Paul hauling the camera. We're filming so we can show you guys what not to do. Because here's why. You go and ride with experienced riders wherever you are. And they see you trying. They will wait for you. They will give you tips because they see you trying. But you, you go and go to the front, take a long pull, and then you get dropped. They'll be like, okay, why were you pulling? If you can't hold the group pace, why are you pulling? We got other people to pull. We talk about it here all the time. They know about it. They watch the Tour de France. They watch whatever. Even though in the tour, they don't really, the commentators don't get into that. But that's what this is about. I'm using that film to educate people. I don't care about people's feelings. They'll get over it. There's a way to do it. I want to show people the proper way. And so the people who are not doing it improper, properly, if they want to know how to do it properly, then they need to come watch the channel. When I go on that, those rides, I go to ride. I don't talk about this channel. Because even I think somebody was saying, why don't you say this about the channel? Even my buddy Paul one time said, I've already told him. You know, they know about it. I'm come check it out. But people don't like to invest their time in educating. They want you to answer a direct question or whatever. It doesn't work like that all the time. You got to invest your own time. So, yeah, I took the time to explain this because, yes, I'm aware it may hurt people's feelings. I've already made it clear on this channel. I don't have a lot of friends. <laughs> I can count them on one hand. That's okay. I couldn't manage a lot of friends. It's not a popularity contest for the channel. I want to educate whoever watches the film to say, don't do this. Don't go anywhere, anywhere in the world. And somebody waits for you, gives you a wheel, and you attack them. Think about it. That's rude. OK, somebody gives you a wheel and they pull you back and you're struggling and then all of a sudden you feel good and you attack them. What do you think the next time they're going to do that? That's the kind of stuff we run into all the time with these guys. They're not even aware that it's not something you're supposed to do. So I understand that they're not aware. But when I film it, I got to let you guys know. That's what that's about. OK, let's see here. <laughs> Muna says, do I need to change my chain length for different cassettes? No. You change your chain lengths for different chain rings, not cassettes. All right. Uh, Sion Lynch, I remember you. Hey, from New Zealand. Wildcat says it's 300H300. I'm not sure. Zero hours, 300. I'm not sure what that is. I think he's talking to somebody. Um, <laughs> yeah, this was C. Cooler. C. C I, I hope I pronounced it Cooler. Cooler. That's a very good comment. I'm glad you said that, but I want you to understand that. I don't say anything on the narration I wouldn't say to them. They just don't know. It's not like, I don't think they're bad guys. Or what, they are not aware. They, just, they don't know, really. That's it. And we are aware of that. So we teach them where our legs. I don't say anything to them when we're riding. I only narrate the video. When we're riding, they learn. They end up riding alone. Let's see here. Um... I'm going to try to get through these chats. We're running down to the two-hour mark. And Wildcat said, Bonsoir, shit. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking French. There we go. Uh, dude, you are from Liberia. Yeah, you got that right. I knew it. You look like George Ware and you speak in metric. <laughs> yeah, George Ware, uh, I believe he's a soccer player. Yeah. I grew up in Monrovia. I came to the United States in 1983 for college, what they call secondary education. Um, I, I learned in Liberia, we learn about the whole world. We don't just learn one language or whatever. We do, you know, we learn about the world. So I knew about the world and all that. I like the metric because this sport, cycling, 
you know, they use kilometers or whatever. And someone suggested it. That's why I do the metric stuff because I was doing miles per hour and some metric. I said, why don't you just do metric? And it just made sense. So I made a video about how to easily convert. It just makes sense. When I used to read Velo News, all the stuff came in. The speeds the guys were doing with, was in kilometers and all of that. So I always played so I can go back between Celsius. You know, and, you, and with the phones now, you can convert pretty easily. <laughs> King George, yeah, King George. Uh, George Weir is trying. I think I don't know if he if he's president now, but he was trying to run for president. He went back, educated himself. A famous soccer player. He played in in uh, I think the UK, and he went back. He's from Liberia, and he's trying to help get things back working over there. So yeah. Let's see here. Science uh, Kia Ora from New Zealand. Have you had any experience training cyclists who have had hip replacements after about 90 kilo on my left artificial hip gets quite tight and movement is restricted. Um, I haven't worked with anyone that has had, had a hip replacement, but any discomfort you're having can be linked back to looking at your setup, your fit. I have dealt with people that have different lengths, leg imbalances because of accidents they had. Because sometimes when you heal, one leg is shorter. And some people are born like that. So, yeah, you have to make sure that you don't need a shim. But I would say look at your fit because if it's tightening up, something is causing that discomfort. Because 90 kilometers, that means that the fit is okay, but then the body has had enough when you go longer. And that's usually a problem with fit. So I don't know if you've had a bike fit. If you've had, go back to whoever did your fit and, and start there and look at that and improve. It can improve your comfort. But I think that's, that's where the issue is. Because that's what that's what usually rears his head. You can tolerate stuff when the ride is short and as you go longer. So um, yeah, yeah, there is something you can do as a question. Yeah, so you you need you need to revisit your bike, your, your relationship between your body and your bike to make sure that everything feels comfortable. Because it's there, the discomfort is there, it's just exacerbated when you go longer. Same thing with people getting numb hands after 45 minutes. Hey, Wilson. Wilson Costa, one of the guys that uh, in the coaching program. Wilson is a chef. He sent me this stuff. He sent me some pictures of food. And my wife saw it. She's like, you need to be cook. I said, I'm not a chef. So you need to be making stuff like that. I'm not a chef. So you try to get me in trouble there. There we go. All right. Uh, SMP. So Sion Lane says, SMP saddle, taking on your word. I'll call my SMP light 209 and upgrade. No more thoughts to wear my butt anymore. So it worked for him. Yeah, SMP has a lot of models, and you. The biggest thing, if you have a, a dealer that has loaners, that's perfect. Because other than that, that's why I went with the dynamic. Because Steve Hogg on his write up said this works for most people, and I didn't have a local guy that was going to spend you know three hundred some dollars on, on just anything. So that, and I'm glad it worked. El Mascarado says everything he says about bike fit is spot on. I've been riding and racing for twenty plus years. It all boils down to fit. Yeah, I mean, from experience. I, when I was racing, I wasn't fortunate enough to have a fitter. That's how I got into it because I got tired of being uncomfortable. So I reverse engineered everything to understand because I did a fit kit. I paid for it. It was still crappy. It didn't work. Went to some bike shop. Back then, the fit kit was the thing, that, you know, and it just didn't work. So I just did it by feel and got an understanding so I can look at somebody and see how they look and whether their knees accelerating and whether they're balanced, you know. So yeah, that just comes from experience. TT Elder and Paul. So the Super Magneto is good enough trainer for your training programs. They are really pushing the. Yes, I recommend the Super Magneto Pro. That's what I use. That's what I. You don't need any crazy stuff. I know they got smart trainers, all that stuff. Now. I get on my trainer. I'm doing a workout. I'm not there to socialize. There are times when I'm spending more. I may turn on a program. I got a television. I, watch YouTube, whatever. I do a lot of research, so I will just run a video, educational video, and watch something while I'm spinning. Yeah, Super Magneto Pro. You don't need anything fancy. They're, they've gotten less expensive. I paid 400 plus for mine years ago. It's old, and it still works. I had no problem with it. Yeah, it's bomb-proof. Yeah, easy to set up. I got videos on the channel about how to set it up if you want to check it out. All right, let's go here. I'm, I'm moving a little quicker to wrap get the rest of these. 
Muna said, which gear do I use to climb when cycling? <laughs> I'm not laughing at you. Uh, that's not possible for me to tell you that. That's what I'm laughing at. Um, whatever gear does not allow your legs to tighten up and keep your cadence 70 or higher as a guide. If you want more specifics, it sounds like you're a candidate for either the coaching program or the training plans because the cadences are in there. So check that out on the website, on the services. Yeah, that that's such a, a, a red herring question. There's so much in there, so deep. But that's a base, as a base. You want to be on top of the gear. Paul Ilunga, yeah, Paul's answering that. Okay, Chris, okay. <laughs> Chris is asking Paul what it whether the guy that wrote why he wrote in the dirt. That's Rick. I don't know why he did that. Yeah, that's funny. Okay. Um Edwin Cancel. Is la your last name is Cancel? Cool. I've seen one of those before. He said, Hi Eldred. How about how about the about the last video? The guy don't use common sense when it's tired because it's kind of a rider. In everywhere here in Puerto Rico, in every yeah, not just Puerto Rico. What he's talking about, I'm gonna paraphrase. What he said is the guy was not using common sense, meaning Scott. He's not the only one that does that. They are all over the place, not just Puerto Rico. We got a bunch of them here. The reason I did that in the video, we see it all the time. We kind of smile about it. I we've never gotten it on film that well. So that was a one-off, and I was like, how can I not comment on that? We see it every time. They, they, they do stuff. They break up the group. They get the group scattered all over the road. They discourage the new riders because now the pace is so hard. This person is thinking, I'm not going to be able to go further. Then they turn around. So, you know, it's kind of like they would say, oh, we're going to do steady. And then they change. And then you get out on the road and it changes. Well, if you're going to announce that you're doing steady and, you, and the riders show up expecting steady, that needs to be the pace of the main group. If someone wants to go off and do stuff, let them go. Because you announced you were going to be doing steady. That's what drew these riders. So our goal when we ride is to keep the group together so everyone gets a workout. Because if I stay at the front for 20 minutes, I'm getting a workout. The guy behind me is getting a workout because now he's in the draft. His heart rate is lower because he's not as conditioned. But for 20 minutes, he got to ride at a good pace. That's what they don't get. So yes, I had to say something. I don't care if they don't like it. I don't, there ain't no, no skin off of me. I didn't say anything derogatory. It's just the way it is. They needs to learn. You know, he needs to educate himself. <laughs> See, he played for PSG France and yes, AC Milan. He's talking about Do yeah, King King George. Yeah, yeah. Another great chat. Stay safe. Yeah. Okay, guys. Uh, that's Chris. We're uh, late, but here Jeffrey D. Hey Jeffrey. Chris, take care. We're wrapping up now. Good. I've caught up. Uh, James Thompson, are you an engineer by trade? Um, yeah, I guess. I, I like to consider myself a cyclist, but I do engineering to pay the bills. I guess I did. I don't do it as much. It's still there. Software engineering, you know, but that's the mindset. I studied some of the electrical engineering and other stuff when I was in secondary school, but yeah. I'm very analytical. I'm very matter of fact, logical. If it makes sense, why not? That's just me. That's the way I'm being. I'm one of these kids when you when when I got a toy, I took it apart to see how it would work, and sometimes could not put it back together. It's very like that. So, yeah. Let's see, uh, Jeffrey. My dumb cycle ups has got me up to ninety plus RPM in a in a month. <laughs> it's not. You don't need a smart trainer, man. You just need you you need to do the work. Your body doesn't care how fancy your trainer is. <laughs> Munez Goro, do you have a friend who's a half wheeler? No. Well, the way you handle a half wheeler, uh, uh, Munez, is don't take it personally. Just hold your pace. Let him half wheel. It doesn't matter. In fact, you I would just draft him because if he's half wheeling you, that means he doesn't want to chat with you because we ride side by side when we're having a conversation, and it's kind of rude to half wheel to keep accelerating. Just don't change your pace. Let him accelerate. And he's sitting in the, in the draft. So, you guys, I'm wrapping up. We're done. Until the next time, be good. All you super legends, I appreciate you. Be cool. All right. We're out.